And now our hero, Miss Pac-Man. Not like that. In 3D. There she is. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Laps Gamer Radio. This is your weekly news and chatter episode for the week commencing 15th of February. Uh, as with last week's episode, we'll briefly chat about what we've been playing over the past week and then take a look at the news, which will probably already be old news by the time you hear this episode. Tonight, I've got with me Lee and Kevin. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. So, Lee, what have you been playing? So, still playing Captain Toad Treasure Tracker at the minute. Uh, I said, so I think as I spoke last time, this is the game that's based on the adventures of Captain Toad stages from Super Mario 3D World. Um, so, I mm-hmm. had just finished, I think. I think I just started episode two the last time we spoke. So this is where, um, in the first episode, you play as Toad and you have to rescue Toadette and you have to fight um, sort of two bosses, one of which is called uh, Dragadon and the other one's like this kind of huge blue eagle character. And um, yeah, so getting to the end of the episode, like I said before, I was kind of surprised at the end credits roll, but now I'm into episode two and obviously that's just kind of like how the game's been structured and um, it's kind of odd in a way because although it's repetitious in the sense that although now I'm playing as Toadette to rescue Toad and of course the, the gameplay mechanics are largely similar and um, I would say the levels are getting more complex but the uh, the boss battles are are kind of like a revisitation of who you've previously fought so I, I had to fight uh, Dragadon again they'd made it slightly different this time around so it's still kind of like entertaining but you don't then have another repeat uh, confrontation with the, the Blue Eagle within that episode now I suspect when I go into episode three where you switch back to Captain Toad to rescue Toadette that that probably will crop up again but it's just just interesting I just wonder whether it was this originally going to be a download title where they were just going to put out episodes for you to buy um, and the rest is DLC or was it only ever going to be a very short game and be like a budget release and then they decided to expand it with episodes so I mean it doesn't it hasn't affected my enjoyment in any way and I I really do actually think this is one of the most enjoyable games I've played on Wii U because it it simply captures that that wonderful magic that Nintendo know how to do where the game is uh, incredibly simple to grasp and then it's got incremental challenge if that's what you want to do so not only do the levels get slightly harder but also if you were going to try and 100% the game so to speak and get all of the hidden mushrooms on the levels and all of the you know the the three hidden crystals and collect all the coins you know it it then becomes a a much more substantial challenge so I love the way that you can kind of like choose how you want to progress through the game nothing so far has been like locked out where I've had to do a lot of backtracking I think you do have to have a certain number of crystals to unlock uh, certain you know mission levels but that hasn't been an issue so far what I mean is like it feels like it's stopping just as it's getting going and then you're kind of like starting again and I like the cutscenes they're beautiful to look at but it, uh, yeah it just feels like a, a sort of intrusive way of structuring the game I mean I don't I haven't really researched into the developmental backgrounds of the game I so I don't know maybe a listener will know more than I do but yeah it's just odd that they've decided to do that uh, and put in these kind of like artificial barriers uh, to kind of like segment it I guess do you wonder uh, maybe it was originally devised as possibly DLC for uh, Super Mario 3D World? Oh, that's a good idea. I, I mm. can see how it would. I mean, I don't want to do it a disservice. I mean, I think anyone who's played through those missions, those Adventures of Captain Toad missions in 3D World and has played Captain Toad Treasure Track, they really have, you know, expanded upon it. They've really developed the, uh, the, inc- the intricacies of the gameplay. There's a lot of depth to it. Um, and it is obviously looks just amazing. I, I just think in terms of like maybe the length duration because episode one was only about two hours long I think to play through this one has taken me slightly longer than that and then as I say I'm about to start a third episode and um uh, Jack Smith was telling me on Twitter that there is actually another you know thing that you unlock after that like a, a set of bonus missions so I think overall when you factor in how long it might take to to do like a hundred percent playthrough, it's certainly going to have you know the the length that would justify a retail release. But I, I just don't know whether it's the project started at a certain stage in development, like you're saying, as as not being a full retail release. Um, but then obviously in development, if they have changed it, why why still put in those? those episodes I mean it's not even the fact that it's split into episodes that I guess I'm, I'm finding a puzzlement it's just that the way they've been separated so like I said you have two boss confrontations about 
Um, so it's like a little beautiful sort of children's storybook and you, you're going through pages in the book. You know, you have to click A and you then go into the, the screen, you know, very, very much like a Mario 64. Yeah. You know, you jumped into pictures to go into the levels in that where you hmm. kind of like push A and, you know, it brings the page to life and you go into that world. And then sort of halfway through, um, you, you have a boss confrontation and then towards the end you had another one on episode one. And, and because like you only have the one boss battle halfway through the second episode, it just seems odd. It's almost like, you know, when um, Peter Jackson was obviously adapting Tolkien's work, he had to put in these uh, artificial film breaks, you know. <laughs> but, and obviously yeah. you had three books in terms of Lord of the Rings, but he didn't adapt the books equally, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. for example, he split events in two towers across two films. Um, so it's kind of like, yeah, a little bit odd like that, whereas like they haven't really clearly done that here. Um, I mean, maybe it will become more apparent uh, in terms of the game design. I'll get a broader appreciation once I've actually finished the game. Um, but that is like a really kind of like minor aspect of Bill Wilderman just on myself, but, you know, personally speaking, that it's not a flaw in the game. And, uh, you yeah, know, I've really, really enjoyed it. Like I say, I think I love it that you can, it's one of those games that you can completely play at your own pace whilst there's uh, moments of it's difficulty in the sense if you've got to avoid certain obstacles or you've got to think about solutions of how you're going to discover your pathway through the level it's actually incredibly kind of like relaxing you know because it is one of those ones where you can just stop and reflect and and I, I thought I found the controls work really well I think you were talking last week Mark about how you're not particularly keen of using the gamepad for kind of motion uh, controls when it came to things like aiming in Splatoon and yeah. the fact that they do incorporate a bit of that in well they they uh, allow it as a control scheme in Captain Toad to move around mm. the environment um, but the, you know just using the, the combination of that and mainly the right stick to kind of spin the world around on a pivot um, it, it just works really well and it's like anything that you know you only need to play through a few levels and then it becomes really intuitive um, and you know just a simple joy to play through so yep making progress through that definitely will play it through to the end um, and then you know a bit like Kirby I suspect it'll be something I continually pick up every now and again to kind of like edge towards 100% completion you know because that's where you get the value for these games you know they're not cheap Nintendo first party titles although I think both Kirby and Captain Toad were, were under you know like the, the usual uh, they weren't as much as like 3D World for example but again you get great value through the replayability of it so yeah very much another kind of recommendation and I'm already if we're going to jump ahead it's kind of like the end of the year I'll, I'll definitely suspect that, that Captain Toad might feature on my kind of like games played in 2016 list and uh, another game uh, on the Wii U I've been dipping back into like an ongoing thing really is Mario Kart 8 so obviously we had the game night that we spoke about last week and I've just really been continuing to play through uh, the Grand Prix modes in multiplayer with my wife and son so we've been doing it on his user profile because um you know, as you go through it and progress and get different styles on the different uh, cups and including the DLC, you get to unlock all the characters and all the kind of the vehicle customization options. And he, and he, he loves it when like, you know, something new has been unlocked and he immediately sort of says, if, you know, if we get to the end of this one and something's unlocked, I'm going to play it again <laughs> you know, <laughs> using that bit of vehicle customization. Lee, can you play on my profile as well, please? <laughs> um, but um, that's also a really great way to get coins. You know, like we were talking that... Um, my son really wants to get like the, all the unlock all the gold aspects of the of the character in the car, and that's like really hard to do because I think you have to get like a star on every single Grand Prix, including Mirror Mode, and then be all of the staff ghosts. You know, something that's probably going to be without you know beyond uh, my skill in the game. Um, so although that's you know I've told him that's like a life project <laughs> that he might have to carry <laughs> on uh, when I give up playing games, um, but it's it's great to kind of get the coins ratio up. So I think there is um, a really high a number of coins you have to collect but you then get given you know part of this like golden perfect package again i think it's like a golden driver a golden car and golden wheels and golden you know flying thing you know like when the car flies you oh. get different like uh, parachutes or whatever so i think if you get the coin one that you can unlock one aspect of that mm. so yeah doing the the multiplayer um, Grand Prix you collect like tons of coins particularly when my wife is quite happy just to stay at the back in 12th and drive into every single individual coin <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so that's been some fun kind of like family uh, game time yeah that's um, that's how me and my girlfriend managed to unlock pretty much everything apart from the gold um, cart bits on America 8 is just 
playing two player Grand Prix and just going through because when you the more people you've got the more coins you pick up and it's surprisingly how quick you'll actually unlock everything if you play that way I'll play through the entire life cycle of the Wii U and even if people are saying you know the NX is coming out and is on the horizon and um, you know that I will be playing Mario Kart 8 up until the next iteration in that franchise because I've mm. pretty much played through most of them it's just again which again which I'll probably raise in relation to another game I've been playing it's the GameCube ones they're the ones that I've missed out on uh, in like all of these kind of core Nintendo franchises but um, mm. other than that yeah you know like Mario Kart Wii for example I think probably was my most played game on that system um, mm. just because of like you know the online multiplayer and again playing local multiplayer sort of couch you know in the yeah. home so I'll, I'll probably be doing that you know for many months to come so uh, you know and it'd be great to get you know some of the community on and do some uh, game nights and that well I've been playing a uh, slightly different Mario Kart um Yesterday, uh, me and my girlfriend decided to take a trip to Great Yarmouth to uh, walk along the beach in the bitter cold and have some proper fish and chips. But um, most importantly, yeah, (laughs) but uh, most importantly to uh, hit the arcades. Um, So I played through a bit of um, Sega Championship uh, Rally uh, and a a few other classics. But we spotted in the corner of one of the arcades um mario kart arcade gpdx which is a uh, mario kart arcade machine i'd never seen before um we ended up spending far too much money playing that um <laughs> and that's a great arcade machine if you ever if you're ever in an arcade and you spot one i definitely recommend giving it a go it's a little yeah. different from um regular mario games because you don't pick your, you pick your racer and then a camera above the screen takes a picture of your face and then if and then put, puts it in the, the character's face for instance like I was playing as Wario so I had Wario's hat and his nose and moustache so it looked identical then yeah <laughs> yeah like pretty much in the mirror. <laughs> almost yeah yeah sorry no it wasn't Wario it was uh, it was Waluigi <laughs> so I had that wonky moustache and, uh, and a funny nose um, and then you get like a roulette you hit the button on the on the con- on the the um, arcade machine and the roulette wheel stops and it'll pick a car a set of wheels uh, and two different weapons and when you pick up a um, a weapon drop you'll either have a weapon that you can fire forward or a weapon that you can fire backwards because you've only got the one weapon hit but apart from that it's just like Mario Kart um, when you want to go around a corner uh, tap the brake pedal when you're turning and you start drifting when you when you straighten up you'll get your boost um, it's really really good uh, the announcer of the race is far too loud and far too annoying um (laughs) (laughs) and he doesn't ever stop talking especially if if uh the the people playing keep overtaking each other but um it was ridiculously good fun and i I spent about 20 quid in that machine (laughs) yeah i've definitely played mario kart arcade i'm not entirely sure Mm. if it's this iteration because um as most uh dads will probably know uh, if they've got young children when you venture into one of those like indoor like play centers um they often have like the odd arcade machine and there there is one that we do go to occasionally and they did have a mario kart arcade game in there for a while so that was that was great fun playing that with uh, with harrison the roulette selection of cars is just exactly how i play it anyway so it would be <laughs> no different <laughs> yeah it makes it a little bit interesting you can't pick um your favorite vehicle and wheels and everything like that so you, you kind of got a bit of a gamble as to whether you'll get something you're comfortable with or whether you'll get a big lumbering heavy cart that you don't know how to get around corners but um it is very good fun very good fun I've gone to the uh, 3DS and managed to step away from Nintendo Badge Arcade long enough to actually play <laughs> a game that I got for Christmas and that I'd really been long wanting to start. So I've started Luigi's Mansion 2 Dark Moon. Um, like I was saying earlier, the GameCube is just like a massive blind spot, although I did um, get to hold those tiny little mini CD discs around a friend's house and play uh, whatever game, like whatever version of ISS came out on the GameCube um, and a couple of other games. I've never you know, gone into that library, so I've never played Super Mario Sunshine or anything like that. Oh so I hadn't God. played the original <laughs> Luigi's Mansion, um, but only ever heard like how fantastic it was. It's superb. Yeah. yeah so I, I, that's why I, I really, really want um, GameCube games to come to the Virtual Console on the NX. Um, you know, because I, you know I was looking into ways of somehow connecting the Wii up to because um, because the original Wii that I've got is kind of like not in use anymore because obviously the backwards compatibility of the Wii U. Um, so I was thinking of ways of protecting that's a computer monitor, but I don't know. I kept hearing that the playback yeah. wasn't very good, and um, 
you know, in terms of like getting another console and things like that, I just, I just sadly at the minute, I just don't think I've kind of got like the the real estate <laughs> to be able to like expand into like that retro collection. Um, so yeah, really hoping that does come out. But you know, in the meantime, playing this this expanded sequel um, has been you know great fun. It's actually because um, you know we're I know Kev will mention it in a moment that we're playing through Grim Fandango as our kind of like playlist game. Mm. And I have started that as well. Um, what, what struck me about Luigi's Mansion that I, I guess I wasn't expecting is that he is quite like um, a point-and-click adventure game in some respects. I mean, it is a, a, a character adventure game, but, you know, just some of the kind of like objectives and things that you have to do just really reminded me of that. So, for example, I've only played through the um, the first mansion in the game. And I think there was only one mansion, wasn't there, in the actual original yeah, there game? Yeah, so that there's I think there's five or so in this one, um, but just playing through the first one, you kind of get the uh, your you play like missions at a time. And one thing that I did find quite frustrating is that you don't seem to be able to save like mid mission, so you you have to play that mission from beginning to end in you know your whatever time you've got allotted to play games at that particular session. Otherwise, you'll have to restart it. So I did have to replay a fair few missions, but I think they're only about probably twenty to thirty minutes in length. Um, and you get like a different objective that you've got to achieve each time and you know it all revolves around kind of exploring this haunted mansion and going into the different rooms and you know you have to retrieve that um is it the poltergust 5000 you know you have to <laughs> retrieve your weapon in one of them that you use to suck up the ghosts and there's others where you have to kind of like collect different kind of parts of a, of a gear mechanism and it opens up other aspects of the mansions and i love all that on them you get like the map on the the bottom screen and then the brilliant graphics uh, 3d graphics on the the top screen and um the way the mansions kind of work almost it's like very um, multi-level so you think you've gone through like the entirety of the mansion but of course there's different levels and floors and then there's different kind of entrances that allow you to get to different kind of crevices uh, and just really kind of clever again the way like trademark nintendo the way they kind of layer on introducing different gameplay mechanics so on one of the missions you might have to shine a particular torch that reveals hidden doors and um, you know hidden enemies or you might have to go through and clear all of the cobwebs out and that kind of like leads into what the final boss confrontation for that first mansion is going to be and i don't think it is a spoiler obviously it's an older game but also this is the first mansion um and i think i've seen it actually a lot of times when the game's advertised you 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 confront this like huge spider and it's just really kind of clever actually the way that you have to kind of defeat um obviously you catch the ghost very much in the style of ghostbusters but in terms of like the bosses it's about approaching it kind of like methodically and you have to you have to do different aspects you know, dodging their attack, but it's not like it's not a complete action game in the sense of you're just attacking an enemy. It's more about kind of like using the environment around you. Um, so yeah, I've been finding that really enjoyable. I love the design, like I love the the actual, uh, you know, the art style of the game and the way that they they get kind of like Luigi to hum along with the music if you leave him stationary <laughs> for too long. And you know, like I think Mario used to sleep, didn't he, in Mario 64? You know, games like that if you yeah. leave him inactive. So yeah, all of those little flourishes just make you feel like you're playing, you know, a really kind of like quality product. And the, the cartoony animation, you know, is almost like something like Pixar. And I, I, I really, I'd, I'd love Nintendo to do kind of like more of that because I really enjoyed those kind of like Pikmin shorts that they released. So they've, you know, they've obviously got, um, a lot of skill in that area and you know the different ghosts have got different personalities and you know there's a lot of humor in the game um i just wish i think that it was more drop in and drop out i wish it could kind of like save instantaneously but that, that's more just of, in recognition of the fact that i don't always you know have a certain amount of time you know i've only got like a, a pressured certain amount of time to play mm. the game so um that probably will be one that it might be easier for me to just like allocate uh, a bit of time to do like a mission every couple of days or something so yeah i'll probably end up concentrate because i'm breaking i've realized i'm breaking a game in resolution already only in february um, <laughs> because we're meant to, be, <laughs> meant to be playing one game and like sticking to actually finishing that so yeah i might i might put uh, luigi's mansion on the back burner and try and get through captain toad uh, but of course you know we've got grim fandango on the horizon and i think kev you're going to talk about hey yeah um, well so far i've got as far as the first mission you know the diner mission it's just mind-blowing um you look at it and go Wow, this is what I don't know how old it is now. It's about twenty years old. Wow, is it really that old? I don't know. I mean, good God, it's going back to early PC days, Lucas Arts. Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, you're right. Uh, Nineteen ninety-eight. Jesus. So yeah, so this game can actually vote. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's great. It's frustrating because you 
not exactly sure where you're supposed to be going. I know you're having the same problem, Lee. You know, we're, we're going backwards and forwards. I am, yeah, a lot, a lot. I'm, just, I'm literally just going from one, like, dead end to another. <laughs> but um, yeah. I think what's what's the saving grace so far for me, although I'm only a little bit further on than yourself, is, um, of course, like, the art style, but the kind of wonderful dialogue, which I guess, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, Tim Shave and Double Fine are kind of, like, renowned for. Yeah, I'm having similar problems with it as well. I mean, even though I, I, I played through it, so about 14, 15 years ago, I can't really remember much of it. So I'm having the same problems where I'm, I'm bashing my head against puzzles and I've already had to look up a guide a couple of times um, because it does have that old point and click adventure problem of trying to use every item on every interactable thing in the environment to try and progress. There's so little clues in there, you know, you've just got to try everything and mm. hopefully something will work. I think that's probably why I'm making no progress at all. <laughs> yeah, but having played um, about a third to about a half of uh, A Broken Age, which was uh, Double Fine's most recent point yeah, of adventure. That, oh, that was on PS4. Yeah, yeah, so yeah I've got that. Yeah. 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 All right. yeah it's, it's the same sort of situation with that as well. Sometimes it's just trying everything on everything else to try and work out what you're supposed to be doing next. But it, it's it's just something that's inherent in point-and-click uh, adventure yeah. games. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I've, I'm yet to kind of like really find my groove with it, but, um, I, you know, there's certainly enough kind of aesthetically and humour wise that will get me, you know, to keep on playing. And I am looking forward to, you know, making some more headway and talking about it with you guys and, and hopefully, you know, members of the community as well. So if you're interested in joining us on that Grim Fandango episode, then uh, get playing along and we'll hopefully be recording that episode possibly in the next couple of months and you can obviously send your tweets in or emails or comment on the facebook page whatever's your preferred method to communicate with us uh so apart from hitting the arcades i've uh, been dabbling with the new rocket league maps uh, i've only been able to play two of them so far uh, i can't remember what they're called but one of them is a regular pitch but with an extra section around the side that's kind of raised up so you go up a lip on the side and then there's another platform um, which kind of extends the pitch out to the sides quite a lot and adds a little bit more verticality to it. Um, the one that's really interesting is the circular pitch, which is kind of like they've taken the Rocket League pitch and then sort of bent it round into an almost like horseshoe shape, but it meets behind the goals. So the two goals are connected behind each other. And so you're driving round in a circle to get from one goal to the other, or you can take a shortcut by driving into your goal and coming out the other team's goal. And there's like a hump in the middle, uh, which you can use to, to 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 boost up and get some some uh, to get into the air quite a bit. So if you want to, if you time it just right, then you can get some crazy mid-air interceptions. I'm still having up and down moments with that game. Sometimes I'll jump in and uh, into a game and it'll end six or seven nil to the other team, uh, and sometimes they'll jump in and our team will absolutely dominate. There haven't been that many tight matches, but but I've, I have got some recordings of a couple of tight matches, so I'll uh, get those uploaded to the uh, to the YouTube channel sometime soon. Jump back onto Destiny again uh, over Valentine's week. So from last Tuesday through to uh, tomorrow, uh, the 16th, uh, they've got this uh, new mode running called Crimson Doubles, um, in which it's a special multiplayer mode where you jump in as two people against another two people. Uh, and if you get killed, you don't respawn. Your teammate has to respawn you. And if you both die, then it's the end of the round and it's first to five to win a match. And it was infuriating in a way that I couldn't think was possible in Destiny. I've played um, quite a lot in the past of Destiny's premier multiplayer, like a PvP mode called um, Trials of Osiris, which is where the top tier multiplayer players go. And that's 3v3 if you die, you're down, unless your team gets you up. Uh, if if uh, one team wipes with the team that's in the round, first to five, go on and so forth. And that is infuriatingly hard, but kind of fun and there's some really good rewards for it crimson doubles was full of the sweatiest um hardcore top tier pvp players who were going in and just wrecking us i don't i was playing with my friend mike and we played a good few hours over a couple of nights and we didn't win a single game and uh, we were just getting utterly destroyed it seems like every single match we were we were up against some of the best players in the game repeatedly um and that wouldn't be a problem if it wasn't for the fact that the rewards were awful and the community as a whole rebelled. Um, there's been a bit of a malaise in the um, uh, Destiny community recently because Destiny 2 has been pushed back to 2017. There was no talk of any expansions coming out this year. All they talked about was having these little events like the Crimson Doubles and they had the, the Sparrow racing a while ago and they had a special event on over Halloween and so forth. And we thought it was just going to be lots of this and lots of people, myself included, were thinking, well, apart from getting together with friends to play the raid, there's not really going to be any point to playing this game 
for the foreseeable future. Um, but within moments of Activision having their um, their big um, shareholders meeting, um, they announced that there is going to be a big expansion coming in spring this year. They haven't released any details about it. They haven't told us whether it will be paid for DLC or whether, as they've said before, they're going to use the microtransactions they've brought in for cosmetic items and dance moves and things like that. Like over the, uh, they've introduced the the um, the Drake Hotline Bling dance uh, recently. I'm not paying for it, but it is quite funny. Um, whether it's going to be, th- they said that they were going to fund DLC through these microtransactions. So fingers crossed, there's going to be a decent expansion in the near future, and it's going to be free, which will do a, a lot to appease the community. Uh, I know it's on the Destiny subreddit that attitudes went from "fuck Destiny" to "ah, oh, we love you guys" in about half an hour <laughs> after that announcement. So. Um, We'll see how that goes. Um, but apart from that, the only thing I've really been playing is, is pushing on uh, more with Bloodborne. I uploaded some footage to the YouTube channel um, earlier uh, last week. I've uh, been helping out some uh, some players online, uh, engaging in some jolly cooperation, as the uh, the Dark Souls and Bloodborne community call it, um, with some of the more difficult bosses in that game, because some of the bosses are brutally hard. Um, and... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm doing really, really well with it. Miyazaki has has smiled upon me, and I'm now two bosses away from being able to finish the game. Although I'm going for a full completion run, and I'm going to I'm going to beat all the optional bosses as well, and then play through the DLC, and then finish the game. And then when that's once that's done, I'm going to um, put together a video with my my thoughts of the, the the whole game and the DLC, and put that up on the YouTube as well. That's great. We look forward to uh, you know watching and listening mm. to that. You know, especially as someone who's you know not going to have access to that game, and it's it's very unlikely that I'd be able to get it yeah. to experience it firsthand. So yeah, you've you've suffered through the pain for us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm a glutton for punishment. Seems to be smashing another <laughs> controller up as well. <laughs> no, I've gotten better with that now. I've, I've got my, like the frustration has has gone away because this is the thing is, is with these games is, and a lot of games when you when you die cheaply, you think uh, a lot of the times it's a problem with the game itself. There's a problem with the mechanics. There's a problem with the AI or something like that. Uh, with Demon Souls, Dark Souls, Dark Souls 2, Bloodborne, and I'm assuming there's going to be the same with Dark Souls 3. If you die, it is absolutely 100% of the time your fault that you died. Because you got too greedy, you went in for an attack when you should have backed away, um, or you should have been healing, or you weren't looking where you were going and you dropped off the edge of the world whilst you were, par- whilst you were rolling around an enemy or, or um, various other ways that you can die in those games. If you die, it is absolutely your fault. And once you come to accept that, the game's not frustrating anymore. You can get frustrated at yourself, but you don't ever get frustrated at the game because it is completely doable. The game is, is at the heart of it, not that hard as long as you, as long as you stay aware of what's going on. Oh, that's where I'm going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, I still find it hard. Oblivious. I still find it hard. I, I still die all the time. It, I still take... Sometimes I'll, I'll come up against the boss and I'll beat them the first time. Sometimes it'll take me a couple of dozen attempts to beat a boss. So um, it's still hard and it can still be frustrating. But if, if you mess up, it is absolutely your fault. So, on with the news. And our first piece comes direct from the Hitman Twitter. And this news, as it broke today, February 15th, uh, Hitman Go, the popular Hitman board game-esque mobile game, is coming to PS4, Vita and Steam on the 23rd of February. This is quite interesting because there hadn't been any news of it any any rumblings of it coming to any other platforms and all of a sudden today they're like yeah it's coming to these platforms and it's going to be out in a couple of weeks <laughs> yeah i saw uh, some of the screens mm. i having not played it I, I thought it looked actually quite interesting i mean i know um it's obviously done well hasn't it and yeah it's a, like a recognizable franchise and i think we get given like a collection of these on mm. ps plus yeah. in the last sort of 12 months and i know it was like a um, sort of ps2 era wasn't it yeah it was, it was one the, the big first three then yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's, again, it's like one I've, I've kind of yet to sort of really spend any time with, but um, I thought this variation looks intriguing, you know, certainly to give it a go on the Vita. Yeah, absolutely. This thing is, is that um, I, my phone screen is too small, really, to be able to play that sort of game on, and my tablet's 
not quite powerful enough really but the vita i reckon will be perfect for it i've been playing a, a fair bit of that um lemmings game they released recently on uh, ps plus for the vita yeah it's yeah. Lemmings touch isn't it and the touch screen works yeah. perfectly and, it, and it's, it's it's more than powerful enough to run uh, hitman go and i'm assuming that it's going to be um cross safe with uh, with the ps4 as well so um i'm looking forward to that i mean i i haven't heard too much about it but what i have heard has been nothing but good Hopefully sometime in the future we'll get Lara Croft because people have been uh, raving about that as well. Don't know a huge amount about it apart from that it looks kind of like a tabletop board game-esque version of Hitman. So um, I'm interested in that. You never know. This Tomb Raider might just get dropped on us yeah. from above. <laughs> like uh, it's coming out. It's coming out tomorrow. Yeah, I was trying to twist um, Michael's arm. Uh, you know, Michael McKenzie, a friend of ours who's been on in the past. I was trying to twist his arm to come on uh, at some stage when he's got some free time to because I know he's been playing through the um, the sequel to. I mean, was it a reboot yes. of? Lara Croft, yeah, you know, the, the one that did very well. You're right, so the sequel to that that's mm-hmm. come to this PC month, yeah. relatively no, last recently, month, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah so, yeah, so I know he's been playing through that and then I've been hearing very optimis- optimistic, uh, you know, noises from him. So hopefully at some point, you know, when he's made some more progress with that, we, we can get him on to talk about it. Because, uh, yeah, no, I imagine, you know, if they do bring, the, you're saying like the Lara Croft Go game across, you know, it's, again, it's about sort of really revitalizing that brand isn't it because it's been on an upward curve since they kind of like did take some more of the sort of uncharted style gameplay into their you know main franchise entry i mean i really liked those um digital titles on psn that were again a variation on the gameplay style you could play through them in co-op yeah like puzzle i based. know the ones you mean i can't remember what they're called though there's two of them something the guardian i think it was something like that yeah anyway guardian and the light i might maybe i'm making it up but i mean i remember from what i played that was really enjoyable i need to go back like so many of the games <laughs> especially where they're digital that yeah. you kind of like you know just completely get a hide from view i need to go back because <laughs> there's some gems in there but i've really enjoyed that one i remember that being very good and i think they did release either dlc or a sequel to it um yeah there was a sequel that was um released on ps plus not too long ago I've not, it's been sat in my ps4 library tempting me for a while Uh, our next piece of actual new news is that uh, as of last night um, February 14th uh, a Dark Souls streamer has managed to complete the game without taking a single hit uh, of damage from any of the enemies in the game um, Twitch streamer V underscore happy underscore hobbit uh, set world's first by completing the crushingly hard original Dark Souls in about four and a half hours without taking a single hit from any enemy wow. in the game, including the bosses. <laughs> that's incredible in terms of like that that short. I mean, I know that people do speed runs on games, yeah. but that's incredible yeah. that you're reducing a game that on average takes, you know multiple hours you know to complete they put it down mm-hmm. to like under half a dozen that's incredible <laughs> that's insane as well that he's not t- taken any yeah. hits at all that's ridiculous has he hacked it <laughs> no 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 I watched uh, I kind of skipped through the, um, the the stream earlier just to watch what was going on and he was m- most of the enemies in the game who's running past and just concentrating yeah. on the bosses themselves but just expertly dodging every single attack like he knew <laughs> telepathically where they were going to attack and when uh, but it's it's something like what I was saying earlier when we were talking about Bloodborne um, once you once you played the game a bit you start to learn the environments and you learn where the enemies are you know how they attack how to avoid their attacks how to counter them and the same with the bosses and it becomes very mechanical and then once you get into the rhythm of it it's not actually that difficult but to be able to get through the game in four and a half hours without taking a single hit just to p- put that in context when I played through the game when I finally finished it it took me couple of hundred deaths and about 50 Ooh, hours wow. to <laughs> right okay <laughs> um yeah so <laughs> uh, i mean this is even more impressive than uh when last year uh the twitch community managed to collectively managed to, to beat the game in I, I don't know how long it took it took them weeks to do uh but similar to the um twitch plays pokemon they managed to complete the game as a community with everyone inputting the commands <laughs> onto the console but to be able to beat the game in less than five hours without getting hit by any of the enemies is just insane. So uh, hats off to him, definitely. Next up, 
coming direct from Nintendo. Uh, Splatoon's next Splatfest will divide the community in this fiercest battle yet. So starting on the 20th of February, so this episode may not be out in time, but we'll tweet about it as well. Um, Splatfest is returning uh, again to, to Splatoon for 24 hours. This time they're asking the heaviest of questions. So in the past they've asked whether you preferred pizza whether you liked pineapple on <laughs> yeah, it's like do you like pineapple on pizza or do you not? And they've asked like do you prefer cats or dogs or so far? But this one is the heaviest of questions. Do you prefer Pokemon Red or Blue? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah friendships will be destroyed brother will fight brother and Pokemon Red will rise as champions because Charizard is best <laughs> I've got my Smash Brothers Charizard amiibo sat at my desk at the moment <laughs> yeah talking of Pokemon I did uh, notice it after uh, maybe a couple of weeks or more back now that they're bringing out a Pokemon detective game aren't they um, I think it's been yes, released in yeah. Japan already um, Pikachu detective yeah, digi- a, a, a yeah. digital download title that um, it's from what I understand it's got some pretty nice production values and it's almost um, borrowing some like maybe Ace Attorney maybe uh, Professor Layton style gameplay so um, you know it's the, obviously the year of celebration for Pokemon so I think if I was going to sample any of it I'd be intrigued to see you know when that comes over what the kind of price is and, mm. and what the gameplay is although I haven't got obviously any sort of brand association or identification with no. the Pokemon themselves that game just is intriguing it's like an odd move you know in a way but that's obviously what <laughs> Nintendo does and the Pokemon company did you see the uh, uh, petition that was going on around the uh, people Pikachu Detective game. Not to cancel it, surely. Wasn't it something about who was going to be the voice actor or something? Yes, there's a petition to have Danny DeVito be the voice of <laughs> Pikachu. Yeah, I think uh, Benedict Cumberbatch other people had been mentioning or something as well. Like people yeah. were throwing out who they would like. Um, but yeah, I think it was just people taking aback the um, the the human-like attributes that obviously personified the, the character with. You know, in that in that little clip. <laughs> yeah. DeVito would make a perfect Pikachu. It seems. Yeah. You know, you don't need a lot of makeup on him either. No. <laughs> <laughs> and having watched uh, a fair amount of It's Always Sunny in oh, Philadelphia yeah, re- yeah. recently, he'd probably just get naked and paint himself <laughs> yellow. He probably does anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So up next, as reported by Kotaku, uh, the UK games industry was worth £4.2 billion in uh, 2015. Yes. (laughs) So um, Yuki and um, MCV have completed their annual valuation of the UK games industry and found that things are better than 2014 by around £200 million. Uh, Console sales are down slightly over last year, but digital sales of games have increased rapidly, making up £1.2 billion pounds in sales and presumably this is due to more aggressive and more frequent sales on digital stores of the three consoles as they try and push uh, more towards the steam model and try and edge physical game shops out the window uh, a little bit but i did see that um used game sales were up quite a bit last year than they were uh, on 2014 i presume because in 2014 everyone was buying new consoles and getting new games whereas last year people were buying used games a little bit more and uh, the mobile market is continuing to increase uh, exponentially year on year i mean speaking as a lapsed gamer myself i very very rarely actually buy anything new and even more rarely mm. buy something on a download uh, basically, because that's interesting. Yeah, I don't because I'm I'm almost the complete opposite. Although I don't buy a great number of games, mm. um, I tend to get them as gifts, you know, for birthdays, Christmas, things like that. I I don't think I ever buy second hand. Really, and I would always and I'd always and I do buy digital games, but like that's only if it's a digital specific title. You yeah, know, if, if I, often because yeah. the prices aren't. There isn't a drastic enough save digitally for me not to buy the physical disc, even though like I think for ease of use, I probably would have everything on digital, to be honest, because like I just said, I don't really, although I've sold on a lot of games that I regret, <laughs> <laughs> I don't tend to buy used. And I think that's probably because when I the last time I kind of did, maybe around shortly into the Wii life cycle was probably the last time I, I think I bought a Mario Party title second hand mm. and it just just skipped you know and it was so <laughs> frustrating that um, that just put me off so I just don't I just don't bother I mean I know um, that like we've just said you know that, that it, this the second hand or the used game market is huge so there's got to be some level of quality control of course and it's probably improved massively mm. but I think just the pure hassle of having and I think it probably has happened again you know it probably happened before that with something else so the hassle of then having to go and you know haggle over exchanging it just completely put me off so i just thought i'd rather pay 
the extra money and get it new. No, I'd never bothered because half of the time I could never get around to it anyway. I mean, the last... <laughs> yeah, that's most of the point you're right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I bought Just Cause 3 and um, I've blasted through with about... I don't know, 10% of it so far, then that's it. I've not really touched it again in nearly two months now. And, you know, it, I think that's one of the finest games I've played last year. <laughs> but again, um, I, could, I could have just... too little time, exactly, too many games. Exactly, and I could yeah. have picked it up now for half the price and still got as far through it now. You know, and I just think, oh, that's just money wasted. I haven't picked up a used game myself in quite a while, and I don't. I haven't traded in a game in quite a while either because I'm a bit of a hoarder, and I like to. I like to collect games. I've got quite a, a library going yeah, back. You wait um, till the children the arrive. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> well, I'll, sorry, I'll probably still keep them and just put them in boxes and yes, yeah, put them. them, store them away <laughs> somewhere. Um, but I've also I haven't bought a special edition of a game since destiny in september 2014 um but i'm a bit of a sucker Witcher, for a, you, you got didn't you get wasn't that like a, a special no edition? no no, just, just, no that was just, that's the, just is the packaging it is just very special oh, sorry, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah the packaging just came with lots of nice stuff in it because cd project read a nice yeah. like that um but i've got some i have got some lovely i, I mean i bought like I've, i'm just looking up at my collection now and i've got the um i bought the special edition of nino cooney which came with a physical copy of the um uh, of of the, the the wizard's book and um, how many hours is that have you got? Uh, Nino Cooney, I, I finished that. That was um, that was a couple of years ago. I'm impressed because that's yeah. a long one, isn't it? That is a long one, yeah. <laughs> well, when I say finish, I finished the main game. I didn't finish the post game stuff. But uh, yeah, I um, I have been taking advantage a lot more of the the, the digital sales on um, on PS4 quite a lot uh, recently because they have been having deals a lot more regularly and and the price slashing has been a lot more aggressive mm. i figure they are trying to slowly move towards a future that xbox and to a lesser extent sony uh envisioned in the future where they wanted to move to a more digital format where they controlled the game sales and they could control mm. the price and maybe bring it down a little bit i mean at the moment when games first came out the first come out on the digital platform they are still prohibitively yeah. expensive um 55 pounds um for certain games whereas you can get them for 40 quid uh, physically, but their sales, I mean, some of the deals have been incredible. So, um, I've bought quite a lot of digital titles over the last year. Yeah, I'd, I'd still say I'm probably 50 um, 50 in the sense that, you know, I buy a lot of the, you know, first party Nintendo games, obviously at retail at full price. And then, you know, I'll be buying sort of the more sort of indie games like digitally. Mm. Um, mm. And, and unless there is going to be like this drastic, uh, drop in digital pricing uh, that then obviously the physical market will kind of like remain i think in, in years gone by i was very much the same as you mark i'd hoard everything and i'd always buy physical because i would really like the collecting aspect of it but mm. just through multiple house moves because i've moved <laughs> a lot more than the average person and uh, you know obviously expanding family and things like that i've just uh, i've had to bite the bullet and, and because i had periods of really long you know being you know that's why hence the title the podcast laps gamer like there was you know there's a lot of time where gaming had been pushed out of my life for you know prolonged periods so yeah i did have to part with a lot of that stuff but, um you know i think it's great that there still is um you know collectors out there and people that get value from that and, and maybe that's where the future will go where the market might move predominantly to a digital place where you might um i don't know whether we'll get machines that don't have disk drives eventually and things like that and then that'll be all digital but i, I get the feeling that possibly almost like a lot of other physical media you'll still see the enthusiast collectors market thrive in some way so you know mm. hopefully we'll still be able to get the best of both worlds to suit you know different consumers really As reported by uh, Polygon, Hideo Kojima has launched his uh, own YouTube series called Hideo Tube. Uh, everyone's favourite Japanese game developer, well, probably second favourite mm. Japanese game developer, um, <laughs> has launched his own series on YouTube called Hideo Tube on the newly created Kojima Productions YouTube channel. Um, it's, it just appears to be a series where uh, Kojima and one of his mates sits down and just chats for for an hour or so, uh, so the first episode is he's talking through his uh, top ten films of 2015 out of the 90 odd films that he uh, claims to have watched last year. So uh, I mean, um, sometimes it's quite fascinating actually when you hear uh, an artist from one medium sort of express an opinion uh, on another. Like so, obviously in this case, games 
someone working in gaming talking about uh, movies but obviously it works both ways like vice versa when you hear sort of del toro when he's commented about gaming and things like that but so with uh, um kojima there what's he kind of picked out as some of his highlights how, how far uh, did, did um yakuza apocalypse get into his top 10 <laughs> It's not in there at all. Um, <laughs> but there's another film that I'm surprised is in there at all because it's no secret that Kojima is a big film fan. If you play through any of the Metal Gear games, the, uh, especially Metal Gear yeah, 4, yeah, it felt at times like most cinematic. of that was cutscene. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it, he was heavily influenced by three major factors in the Metal Gear series, David Bowie, Snake Plissken, and James Bond. Perfect. <laughs> Yeah, and so I was quite surprised to see that Spectre wasn't anywhere in his top 10. Star Wars The Force Awakens made it in there. Straight Out Compton was in there. <laughs> okay. His number six was uh, Shaun the Sheep movie. And right, Which so. I was very surprised at. <laughs> he did get a sort of James Bond-esque film in there. His number three was uh, Kingsman. Awesome. Which I enjoyed a lot, yeah. Um, his number one, though, was uh, Mad Max Fury Road, and I, I can't nope, really argue with me that. me neither. No. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I thought for a second they were all going to be Japanese films. I didn't realise, yeah, you're talking about just, just generally like all the films that you'd seen. Mm. Yeah, See, I, I'm not entirely sure how good his grasp of English is. I know he can speak some English, um, but he tends to do interviews in Japanese. But his number four film was um, Lock. The, oh, um, God. Yeah, the, the uh, Tom Hardy film. Yeah, yeah the Tom Hardy film. Yeah. yeah. It's just 90 minutes of Tom Hardy in, in a car talking to himself and on the phone occasionally. Yeah, whereas Mad Max is Tom Hardy in a car not talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I know which one I prefer. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, the video is all in Japanese, but if you don't mind subtitles, it's well worth a watch if you're a Kojima fan. And I'm a big Kojima fan, so I've already subscribed to that channel. Red Dead Redemption is coming to Xbox One's backwards compatibility scheme. The only hitch, Microsoft don't want anyone to know, and yet some gamers managed to download it anyway. The 360 version of the 2010 Epic was playable on Xbox One over this last weekend, that was the 13th and 14th of February, but it was removed late on Sunday night. The reason given was that it was actually an accident. It had been released as a test to see if it could work, and apparently it works very, very well. But unfortunately, nobody was supposed to be playing it anyway. And you had to jump through hoops in order to play it. This is raising a few questions. First of all, is it going to be planned as a bonus for a hypothetical follow-up, perhaps? Similarly to uh, Fallout 3, when that came out with Fallout 4. Who can tell? But it's good news, because it means that they are actually doing something in the Red Dead Redemption camp either way. Yeah, so am I, So it's not something that if you were lucky enough to um, take advantage of this, that it's now on your system. No. You, it's not like you've no, downloaded it's gone. it. Right, so it is just completely... <laughs> uh, would it be... How does this... Because obviously I haven't got an Xbox. How does this work? Is it via streaming then? this, Or it's, uh, you download no, it? it's weird. You've got to have the hard copy, haven't you? And oh, sorry, and, right. Yeah. So you've actually got to have the physical but, disc. And it just, <laughs> yeah. How did people know then to... You know, to try it out. It obviously just leaked on the internet. No, it was um, people who've got the, uh, uh, as far as I'm aware, it's people who've got the Xbox One um, preview program where they can, uh, I've only got a very limited understanding of this because I don't have an Xbox One, but people who are on the preview program can, they kind of like beta test new changes to the uh, UI and things like that. And it seems to have been a, a loophole in the, in the preview program that people on there were, were able to play Red Dead Redemption on their Xbox One and through some scheme managed to get other people to be able to get onto mm. it as well. Right. But okay. it very quickly got taken down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm with you. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to be... This is a foreshadowing of, of, a, of another Red Dead Redemption because um, the original and the... Um, Undead Nightmare expansion where it was some of my favourite some of my favourite content on the last generation from yeah. Stop and yeah. that game was a masterpiece well, uh, that's it I mean it so often comes up in top tens doesn't it even now you know and it's six years old now all we can hope for now is that 2016 is the year that we see another Red Dead or as we've said before uh, another uh, Rockstar table tennis game oh yeah. definitely still flying the flag <laughs> for that one <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> 
As again, if you'd like to uh, contact us, then there are various forms you can get in contact with us with via. Uh, you can email us at lapsgamerradio at gmail.com. Uh, you can tweet at us at lapsgamer. And there's the uh, Laps Gamer Radio Facebook page. We should have, hopefully, some content going up to the Laps Gamer YouTube channel at some point over the next few weeks as well. So uh, be sure to look out for that and leave us your comments. Yep, so if you've got any kind of questions or anything really that you'd like us to read out or discuss on the show, then do get in touch. So that concludes our Laps Look at the News. Again, if you'd like to contact us with any, uh, any comments on uh, the Grim Fandango or you'd like to get involved in that episode when we record it at some point in the next few months, then you can contact us uh, through the usual methods. And I guess all that remains is to say goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. And I'm off to play some more Blood Bowl. <laughs> again. Yeah. I'm, I'm off to rescue Toadette again. <laughs> I'm not playing any games again. Last Gamer Radio.